Hello, my name is Alex, and this is my presentation on industrial carbon capture and sequestration, also known as carbon capture and storage, for EES 4760 Air Quality Management. So what is carbon capture and sequestration? Carbon capture and sequestration, also known as carbon capture and storage, or CCS, is the term given to any process that takes carbon dioxide, or CO2, from the atmosphere and converts or stores it, preventing it from accumulating in the atmosphere and contributing in excess to the greenhouse gas effect. CCS occurs in many different processes. Biological processes, such as photosynthesis, capture the carbon dioxide and convert it into nutrients for the plant, breaking it down and preventing its escape into the atmosphere. There are many CCS applications presently being researched that utilize various species of algae. Other natural CCS processes include carbonate capture in various mineral deposits. In this presentation, we will be focusing on the industrial applications of carbon capture and storage. Our primary industries will be the coal-fired power plants and the oil industry. We will be evaluating the coal-fired power plants as our primary supplier of carbon dioxide, while our oil industry will be the primary store of carbon dioxide. So why is carbon capture and storage important for air quality? Carbon capture and storage is expected by the year 2100 to be responsible for over 50% of the cumulative CO2 mitigation efforts globally, according to the IPCC. Recently, the US EPA passed new rules requiring a 30% reduction in CO2 emissions by the year 2030. The US Environmental Protection Agency estimates that over 40% of the US CO2 emissions are from electrical power plants. They estimate that with the implementation of CCS systems, a 500 megawatt power plant could reduce its total CO2 emissions by 3 million tons per year. That is roughly the equivalent of 62 million trees over 10 years, or the annual energy consumption of about 300,000 homes. The International Energy Agency estimates that by the year 2050, one-sixth of the CO2 emission reductions will be attributed to various carbon capture and storage techniques. Global CO2 emissions total about 35 billion metric tons per year with the vast majority being attributed to coal, oil, and natural gas combustion. From 2007 through 2013, the global annual coal consumption increased from 6.4 billion to 7.4 billion metric tons, with China and India being the primary contributors to the demand increase. It is also believed that from the year 2000 through 2020, the demand for coal will double. As John Thompson, director of the Fossil Fuel Transition Project for the nonprofit group Clean Air Task Force, has observed, fossil fuels aren't disappearing anytime soon. With this in mind, we must find a way to use the fossil fuels without the carbon going into the atmosphere. Carbon capture and storage is one such option. Aging oil fields are estimated to be able to store about 33 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide, which is roughly the equivalent of all U.S. power plants over several decades. Enhanced oil recovery is another important aspect of the large-scale deployment of CCS facilities. In the short term, while developing CCS technology, hydrocarbon fuels such as oil and coal will become more plentiful. This could ultimately result in a greenhouse gas emissions wash over time because as the technology improves, it could perpetuate the availability for additional fossil fuels that currently we are unable to access. Currently, the price for carbon capture and storage systems is the greatest hurdle. Enhanced oil recovery may be the best way to mitigate the price issue. Methods for capturing carbon dioxide. Carbon capture has been occurring since the 1930s. The technology has been well demonstrated and proven in small-scale demonstrations or applications. However, only in the last 20 years or so have any large-scale projects been attempted combining all the technology and processes together. There are three primary methods of capturing carbon dioxide. Pre-combustion capture, 
post-combustion capture, and oxyfuel. Post-combustion capture, as the name suggests, captures the carbon dioxide after the combustion process, so the fuel source isn't important. However, higher concentrations of CO2 in the flue gas do make the process more efficient. Post-combustion capture occurs by bubbling the flue gas through an amine bath. The amine compounds bind to the CO2 and can be filtered out of the solution. After separating the bound CO2 amine compound, the compound is heated, releasing the CO2, which is then compressed into a liquid and prepared for transport. The now unbound amine solution is then able to be mixed back into the amine bath and will capture more CO2. Pre-combustion carbon capture can be applied to any solid or liquid fuel source, such as coal or petroleum products. The fuel is first gasified. If it is a solid fuel source, such as coal, it gets pulverized into a fine particulate dust. If it is a liquid, such as oil, it simply gets atomized. Then, the now gasified fuel gets heated to extreme temperatures, reacting with controlled amounts of oxygen, or O2, yielding hydrogen gas, H2, and carbon monoxide, CO. The carbon monoxide is then separated and further reacted to create carbon dioxide that is then compressed into a liquid and prepared for transportation. The hydrogen gas is then used as a fuel source, burning cleanly with oxygen, creating only water as a byproduct. Oxyfuel is the process of burning any fuel source in an oxygen-rich, typically 100% oxygen environment producing large quantities of CO2. This method is very useful in combination with a post-combustion phase because the flue will be nearly all CO2 with few impurities or other byproducts. Transporting of liquid carbon dioxide. The transporting of liquid CO2 has been occurring for a while. It is heavily transported by the food and beverage industry by truck and train. The oil and gas mining industries utilize pipelines and supertankers for transporting it to and from wells designated for enhanced oil recovery operations. Typically, pipelines are utilized for short, high-volume transportation of the liquid. There are four main types of geologic storage. Structural storage, residual storage, dissolution storage, and mineral storage. Any geologic location could utilize multiple storage types. Structural storage is the process of pumping the CO2 below impenetrable bedrock formations, such as shale, and capping the wells with cement and steel to prevent seepage. Residual storage utilizes rigid porous rock, displacing the air that is trapped inside the pores and trapping the CO2, preventing its escape. Dissolution storage relies on the CO2 reacting with salt water, causing its pH to decrease slightly and making it slightly more acidic and dense. This causes it to stratify at the bottom of the aquifer, where it then becomes trapped. Mineral storage is the final method of geologic storage, and it relies on the CO2 to react with the rock that it is exposed to, chemically altering it to form new minerals. Deep saline formations are a fancy way of categorizing aquifers that contain salt concentrations too great for consumption as drinking water aquifers. They are typically found in sandstone formations at depths greater than 800 meters. Many scientists predict these formations, though they are the least explored option, may have the greatest potential for storage. These formations could take advantage of all four of the aforementioned storage techniques. Depleted oil and gas fields are probably the easiest option for purposes of rapid deployment of CO2 storage. They are well-defined and well-studied geologically and have proven to be able to store hydrocarbon compounds for millions of years. Some of these fields would probably become active mining operations again through the process of enhanced oil recovery, as explained later. Oil fields are estimated to be able to store approximately 33 billion metric tons of CO2. 
Unmineable coal seams have also been looked at as storage locations for carbon dioxide because they will displace the methane gas that is trapped inside the coal, resulting in enhanced coal bed methane recovery. Enhanced oil recovery, or EOR, is another application of carbon dioxide storage. It is utilized in oil fields that are nearing the end of their life because the CO2 that gets pumped into the oil field will displace the oil in the bed and increase the oil well pressure. The CO2 will, if soluble, expand the oil trapped in the rock, releasing it from the rock's pores and increasing the well's head pressure. If the CO2 is insoluble with the oil, it will simply use the increased pressure to force the oil out of the rock's pores and release it to the well. This is a widely used method of prolonging an oil well and constitutes about 75% of captured CO2 storage per year. Pioneering the Industrial Carbon Capture and Storage System the first carbon capture and storage project on a large scale was Norway's Sleipner project in the North Sea. It is a fully functional natural gas mining rig that injects approximately 0.9 million tons of CO2 per year into a deep saline aquifer in the North Sea. Operations began in 1996 and was funded through Norway's carbon tax program. To date, the project has injected about 16 million tons of CO2 into the aquifer. Research into CO2 storage in basalt rock the rock found on ocean floors or certain mountains, has resulted in CO2 reacting with the metals, forming carbonate chalks within a year. As David Goldberg, marine geophysicist at Columbia's Lamont Daughtry Earth Observatory, has been known to say, the magic of being offshore is that you are away from people and away from property. Sask Power's Boundary Dam refit became active in 2014. It is located in Saskatchewan, Alberta, Canada. Boundary Dam is the first post-combustion coal-fired power plant to use carbon capture and storage. Along with capturing 90% of the CO2 emissions, it is expected to capture 100% of the SO2 emissions, which it will convert into sulfuric acid for sale to industry, along with fly ash, which it will sell to be mixed with cement. Boundary Dam is a 110 megawatt plant that cost about $1.2 billion to renovate and refit with carbon capture and storage technology. With the lessons learned on this project, future projects are expected to have costs reduced by 20 to 30 percent. The CO2 captured at this facility will be used to in enhanced oil recovery projects within the region. In the United States, Kemper County, Mississippi, has a 565 megawatt gasified coal power plant coming online with CCS technology later in 2015. The project was originally estimated to cost about $2.5 billion, but because of some setbacks, its final bill is expected to be about $5 billion when it comes online. The CO2 captured at this facility will be piped to oil fields about 60 miles south of the power plant. Other projects of note include the Petronova project, which is a joint partnership between a Japanese company and NRG Energy to develop a CCS system for a power plant outside of Houston, Texas. The $1 billion project will supply nearby oil fields with carbon dioxide for enhanced oil recovery efforts. The Green Gen power plant in Tianjin, China, is currently under construction it will be the first CCS system in China and will supply carbon dioxide for enhanced oil recovery projects within China. Summit Power in West Texas is the first Chinese and American partnership on a CCS project. Its CO2 will also go to EOR project within the state once completed. Challenges facing carbon capture and storage. Presently, price is the greatest hurdle that CCS implementation faces. The Kemper project in Mississippi nearly doubled its budget and hasn't come online yet. Mountaineer power plant in West Virginia stands unused because it costs too much to operate. Boundary Dam project in Canada cost about $1.2 billion. 
the CCS systems currently consume approximately 20% of a power plant's power output, and it is still cheaper to pay the cost per ton to pollute than it does to operate a CCS system. Other issues with CCS is that through enhanced oil recovery, it is a self-perpetuating problem. You capture CO2 from burning coal and use the captured CO2 to recover more oil from the production wells, allowing for more oil to be burned, producing more CO2. Some experts believe that through this cycle, the end result will be no net loss in CO2 emissions citing increases from oil offsetting the savings of CCS on, on coal power plants. Research is going into estimating how much storage is currently available in the United States. It is estimated that we have about 4 trillion tons of CO2 storage potential in deep saline and sandstone aquifers. The Cincinnati Arch Geologic Test Site near Rabbit Hash, Kentucky, received 910 metric tons of CO2 successfully injected into a saline aquifer between 3,200 and 3,600 feet below ground. The sandstone formation is part of the Mount Simon sandstone formation. Another significant hurdle with carbon capture and storage processes and technology is public opinion. The not in my backyard, or in this case, not under my backyard, sentiments become apparent. This is the sentiment of a population being okay with something so long as it doesn't affect them. Popular examples include prisons and landfills. In 2011, Europe had 14 carbon capture and storage projects proposed or in the works. By 2014, they were down to five projects surviving because of the sentiments expressed in the not in my backyard philosophy. In conclusion, carbon capture and storage is an emerging solution to the greenhouse gas emissions problem. They have shown that the technology works and the more projects that survive into operation will not only help drive down CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions, but will also help reduce the costs of further projects if they heed the lessons learned from the already operational plants. Coal-fired power plants were the focus of this presentation because of their large percentage of contributions to CO2, but CCS technology can be implemented into many other industries as well.